I'm here again to continue my lectures. We now have a look at uh, the continuation of uh, the way by which you analyze fact-centered problems. And uh, I hope when you finish all these uh, examples, you have mastered very well how to do it. So let's have a look at another illustrative question. So this is short. So let's have a look at this. In 2018, Caruso, a resident Filipino citizen, received dividend income from U.S.-based corporation, which owns a chain of restaurants in the West Coast, USA. You start analyzing the moment you see a particular set of facts such as this one. For example, you have seen that Caruso is a resident citizen, he received income. Technically, how is he going to be taxed on that income? The dividend limited to Caruso is subject to U.S. withholding tax to the spec of a non-resident alien like Caruso. What will be the advice to Caruso in order to lessen the impact of possible double taxation on the same income? So, so immediately what just comes to your mind is what are the modes of reducing the impact of double taxation? So let's see. You have an answer if the weight is 5% or less, which may be a one sentence answer. So let's look at the one sentence answer here. I would advise Caruso that he could choose whether to avail of a tax credit deducting the withheld amount from his tax due in the Philippines or deducting the withheld amount from his gross income in the Philippines. Uh, if you know the citation, then cite it, but it's not imperative for you to cite the exact provision of the law. Now, supposing the weight is more than 5%, then you must expand this particular answer by coming up with further explanations. I would advise Caruso that there are two options that are available for him in order to lessen the impact of possible double taxation on the same income. He could choose to deduct the amount withheld by the U.S. authorities from his gross income derived from sources within and without the Philippines, provided that he does not state in his income tax return his desire to avail of tax credits for taxes paid to foreign jurisdiction. In the alternative, Caruso being a Filipino citizen, could signify his income tax return, his desire that the taxes would help by the U.S. taxing authorities as a tax credit or the deduction of the income taxes he is to pay the income authorities. This is subject to the condition that the total amount of the credit should not exceed the total proportion of the tax against which such credit is taken, which Caruso's taxable income from sources without the Philippines bears on his entire taxable income for the same taxable year. Then you have this provision here. Of course, the best possible choice for Caruso would only come about after a determination which among the choices could result to lower income taxes to be paid the Philippine government. Differences? 5% or less, just one slide. More than 5%, four slides. So you notice that 5% uh, or less is simpler. Now, let's look at the answer of uh, Stanislaw Fernandez. And notice that this answer is analyzed in accordance with the one-to-one -one correspondence we we're talking about a while ago. But it is no it is no that. Why is it so? Because the concept of century was invented only during World War II. And notice here, this was 1933 when Estela Fernandez obtained fourth place, having a grade of 97 in criminal law. By the way, for the younger generation, you probably didn't know who Stanislaw Fernandez was. He was a former senator and former Supreme Court Justice. He was known as the defender of Lydia Dean, and what's the story behind that? Lydia Dean was a Filipino, she's a Cebuana, was married to an American. She was charged with murdering her American husband in the U.S. Since the late Tanning Fernandez is authorized to practice in the Philippines and also in the U.S., he was hired by Lydia Dean to defend her and he was able to obtain an acquittal. Uh, as a result of that, he became very popular, was known as the defender of Lydia Dean, so when he ran for the Senate on that platform, 
you want. Interesting. What was the question asked in the 1930 bar exams where Sergio Fernandez got 97%? A bought a revolver which we intended to take B. Your A could go further in his plan, B left the country, and A was not able to carry out his intention. Is A subject to prosecution for attempted murder or homicide? State the reason. So what is the issue here? The issue is that, was there an attempt? So let's find out how uh, the late uh, Senator Justice Fernandez came up with this answer. Of course, he must conclude. But his conclusion is actually a it is respectfully submitted that A is not subject to prosecution for attempted murder or homicide. It is archaic because the moment you have written an answer, you are already making a respectful submission. So that's not to say that it is respectfully submitted. No. And then he came up with the statement of the Black Death Rule. There is an attempt when the offender commences the execution of the felony directly by overt acts but does not fulfill all the acts of execution necessary to constitute the offense by reason of accident or causes other than his own spontaneous resistance. So he quoted the, the revised penal code, but didn't state the article number. He went on further to state, the mere buying of a revolver, although it was with the intention to kill B, cannot be considered as an overt act, for the overt act means an act inevitably tending towards the offense and material acts. Notice he still has to continue, and it is a rule of statutory construction in criminal law that the intent to kill must be judged by means of the acts done. From the mere buying of the revolver, no such interpretation can reasonably be used for there are a hundred other lawful purposes for which a revolver may be used. Now, let's modify the answer because the answer to my mind seems to contain a lot of surpluses. So, Notice there are three slides, so let us reduce. We said that the answer of uh, Fernandez was too long and we have to reduce it, removing the different surplus aids. So we now say, A is not subject to prosecution for attempted murder or homicide. We adapt also his statement of how he stated this black rule. There is an attempt when the offender commences the execution of the felony directly by overt acts, but does not fulfill all the acts of execution necessary to constitute the offense by reason of accident or causes other than his own spontaneous resistance. By a revolver with the intention to kill B cannot be considered an overt act, indubitably tending towards the offense material acts. Even buying the revolver is not such an overt act, but there are a hundred other local purposes for which a revolver may be used. Notice there are now two slides. So we were able to reduce it by one slide. Now, let's look at a more interesting answer here. We have the answer of former Senator Arturo Tolentino. He got 91% in civil law and obtained first place in the 1934 bar examination. So let's look at the question that was thrown to him in 1934. So we see uh, it's a long problem. And therefore, since a long problem, we look at the end in order to know what is the question here. Now, the question is, do you think that outstanding the laws of the house, A will be entitled to recover from B the set expenditures? Why? So having seen and known the question at the bottom and what the examiner wants, we now look at the factual setting for us to be enabled to come up with an analysis. A built a house on land belonging to B in the belief that the land was his own. So this is builder in good faith. So immediately when you see this issue of builder in good faith, automatically you try to find out the rights and obligations of the different parties, the owner of the land, and also the builder in good faith, and whether or not here he has certain rights against the owner of the land, or the owner of the land has superior rights over the ones who has built in good faith. So let's continue. The error discovered 
B formally notified A that he elected to appropriate the house. So they not only decide to appropriate his house, and therefore you try to remember what are the legal effects that arises out of his having appropriated the house. All efforts to reach an agreement as to the sum to be paid to A having failed, A began an action to recover the expenditures incurred by him in building the house. The house was destroyed in a fire of purely accidental origin. Do you think that withstanding the loss of the house, A would be entitled to recover from B the said expenditures? Why? I say the answer of Valentino is interesting because he used the outline of an ideal answer. But notice how he used the outline. Let's go back and have a look at the outline of an ideal answer. Conclusion, blotter rule, interweaving, and then policy considerations if you still have time. So you see how he's able to do that. Probably the subject weight was more than 5%. That's why he had the luxury of time in discussing the subject. So, A would be entitled to recover the expenditures incurred by him in building the house. Conclusion, what you understand up there, you must explain. Notice, as I said, he used the... Uh, ideal outline. Therefore, since he used the ideal outline, he must now state the black letter rule. The law provides, remember he didn't say, according to article so and so of the civil, he didn't say that. He said, the law provides. The law provides that when something is built in good faith upon the land of another, the latter shall have the option to operate the same upon payment of the expenses to the builder or to require the builder to pay the price of the land on which said building was constructed. You must now interweave. This is the way how interwoven. In the exercise of the option, B elected to appropriate the house. By so doing, he incurred the obligation to pay the expenses to A, which is an obligation which does not depend on the continued existence of the house. It may be said that this exercise of the option given by law may lose his own accession, respirate domino, and she must the loss and pay the expenses. Notice how beautiful uh, Tolentino's answered. And that's why he got 91 uh, in the bar in civil law. But there's one thing you should notice here. He used a Latin term, res perit domino. What does that mean? He didn't bother to translate. But let us look at the advantages of using quotations and maxims. So, Let's look at some quotations and maxims, and why is it important for you to make use of them. Remember, quotations and maxims are like salt, soy sauce, or benzene. They give flavor to the food. If you put in too much salt, the food would taste very bad. On the other hand, if you don't put soy sauce, you don't put benzene, the taste is going to be bland. So, they give taste and flavor, but the same token. Quotations and maxims give flavor to your answer. It would catch the attention of the examiner. Too much the uh, food, taste of the food, with the same token, too much also would destroy your answer. Too many written maxims might result in the conclusion that you're a priest or a nun. And if the examiner hates priests and nuns, then it would be to your eternal grief that you use the latent maxims because then he might not give you a very good grade. So let's have a look at some examples of written maxims that uh, you could use in the instance where you decide to make use of written maxims. <coughs> so for a subject, use at the most five quotations or maxims. Let us look at some quotations and maxims that could make, you could make use of in your answers. Let's look at the first one. The first one is, Non omnicul dicet honestum est. What does this mean? Not everything that is legal is ethical or honest. This is normally used in the instance where there's a problem, where there's doubt, whether an act is ethical or not. So remember, non omnicul dicet honestum est. And then we have one which you could make use of in criminal law, specifically in the area of criminal liability or responsibility. El que es cosa de la cosa es el cosa del mal causado. He who is the cause of the cause 
is the cause of the evil caused. So remember, this is what you could quote in the instance where there is, uh, again, an issue on criminal liability. Then you have this uh, from the case of Ali versus General de Castro. Uh, in this particular regard, what happened was that Mr. Ali was a very famous SOB and uh, he was arrested. The issue now is that since everybody knows that he's guilty, it's the need for him still to be accorded his constitutional rights. And uh, the late Justice uh, Cruz, who is very colorful in his uh, language, said that in justifying that Mr. Ali is entitled again to his constitutional rights, specifically, the Reto Council said, lacking the shield of innocence, he must be protected by the armor of the Constitution. And then we have this, um, we have this, uh, the last one, strike but hear me first. You could use this in explaining the concept of due process. Why could you use this and how did this originate? You remember usually you have the Battle of Thermopylae and there, there were 301 Spartans. All of them were killed. So one was sent down in order to advise the king that in fact all the 300 died. Remember Spartans are supposed to die in battle. So with this person now, when this messenger arrived, uh, in Sparta to bring the tragic news, the king wanted him to put to death because he didn't die in battle. So he said, he strike but hear me first. Notice this is the essence of due process. So if there's a uh, due process issue involved, you could say, you could quote the statement of the Spartan messenger to the king, he strike but hear me first. Then you also have one that's interesting. Why interesting? Because sometimes this is used in uh, ethics, sometimes this is also used in negotiable instruments, but negotiable instruments is not a subject anymore in the bar. As between two innocent parties, the one who made possible the loss shall be liable for the loss. And then we have uh, a quotation from uh, the late Justice Senator Justice Fernandez. He was made to explain the difference between theft and staffa. So, so uh, what is the difference between the two? When made to distinguish, he said, the distinction could be distilled in a Spanish saying, El robo alarga su mano, el estapador acera su mano. And then he proceeded to explain in detail the distinction. But what is meant by this one? What is meant by this one is that, El robo alarga su mano, the thief lets go of his hand. There is exportation, there is taking. On the other hand, el estafador acera su mano, because the physical possession is ready with the estafador, he immediately closes his hands. So, notice, very, very interesting. Let's the same way look at another uh, fact-centered problem that I was confronted with when I took the bar in 1985. So, the problem is long. And therefore, since the problem is long, we go and have a look at the question at the bottom of the problem. Was this dismissal valid and legal? So when you see this immediately, what should come to your mind would be the elements of a valid dismissal. With all, all of the elements of a valid dismissal are present, then his dismissal is valid. On the other hand, if the elements, if one of the elements of a valid dismissal does not have a factor equivalent, then his dismissal is illegal or invalid. All right, let's see. We start from the very beginning. As I said, when you look at the problem, try to find out what are the factual elements that are material to the solution of the problem. So, Mr. Alman Reyes, 55, was the Manila manager of the International Milk Company, a multinational corporation with main office in San Francisco, California, USA. So let's see, you're talking about illegal dismissal. Is this age material? Probably. Is the fact that there's a manager material? Probably also. Is the fact that uh, the main office is in San Francisco, California? 
No, it does not have anything to do with the solution of the problem. Let's continue. It branches all over the world. Reyes has served the company in various capacities here and abroad and for 16 years. Notice the fact that they served in various capacities has nothing to do with the problem, but probably the 16 years uh, term tenure would have a material bearing. The main office advised him of his transfer to the San Francisco main office and of his promotion as director of international marketing. Does this matter? Probably yes, because it is a promotion and he was transferred. He refused he refused the promotion for personal family reasons, and this material already. After Reyes had remained adamant in staying in his manila position, the company dismissed him on the ground of insubordination. So this material is a really insubordination, and therefore was a dismissal valid and legal. So I started to analyze, trying to find out what are the elements and then whether there's a one-to-one -one correspondence or whether there's an element of the law that does not have a factual equivalent. So let's find out how I answer the question. The dismissal is not valid and is illegal. Conclusion, and therefore I have to answer now. In the case decided by the Supreme Court DOS versus NLRC, uh, the DOS case was decided two years before I took the bar. But remember what I told you. Master all the cases within the last five years. Fortunately for me, I was familiar with practically all the cases. That's why it was easy for me to cite DOS. When you cite, you must ensure that the case is appropriate. That's why I said. In a case decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, DOS versus NRC, a case which is enforced with the facts of bar cited, cited in the case at bar, it was held that a promotion is in the nature of a grant or reward and may be refused without being guilty of insubordination. I continue. Said the Supreme Court, I cited here a latent maxim, which was cited also in the case. Said the Supreme Court, Ki yuri suo tutur, neminem leidet. He who uses his right does not injury. Huh? It should be does no injury. I made a mistake there. So I copied the verbatim my mistake. So that's, that's no injury instead that's not injury. And this Reyes in refusing to accept the promotion was within the exercise of his rights and he should have been penalized for this. He must explain why. He must relate as in the facts with the law. The fourth court further held in the DOS case that the penalty for dismissal for refusal to accept a promotion is too harsh. Again, grammatical error, there should be two, two O's here instead of only one O. Considering the 16 years of service, the ponente of the DOS case, even quoted from the master of work of Davis, discussion on justice, is proceeded that, well, as in this case, the applicable law is very clear, then all of the equities of the case should be considered. The first Bertus Stan, both man and other legal writer, was likewise quoted when he said, in essence, that in labor determinations, decisions should not be based merely on secundum rationem, but also on secundum caratatem. Thus, the equities of the case are upon Mr. Amon Reyes, and the case should not only be decided on the basis of reason alone, but also tempered with charity. After all, an employee who has served the company for 16 years, presumably loyal and competent service because he's being promoted, should not be dismissed just because he refused a promotion for personal family reasons. Premises is considered this visa is not valid and is illegal. Notice. Good answer, but very long. Fortunately, I know how to write very fast. That's why I was able to state everything and Perhaps you remember my handwriting. My handwriting was very, very legible. So take note again of the reasons why. Here, I think I obtained a place in the bar exams. But as I said, for your purposes, the answer is very, very long. You must learn how to summarize. And therefore, after having read so many cases, thousands of cases, you must learn in essence how to summarize all these cases. Now, let's see. How we could deduce? Uh, let's have a modified answer. The dismissal is not valid and is illegal. In those versus NRC, it was held that a promotion is in the nature of grant or reward 
and may be refused without being guilty of insubordination. Ke yuri a tutor, ke who uses right does no injury, Arman Reyes in refusing to accept the promotion was within the exercise of his rights and should be penalized for this. Notice again, my original answer was six slides. It was now reduced to only two slides. Let us look at another problem I was confronted with when I took the bar. As usual, if it is long, we go to the bottom of the question in order to find out what the examiner wants. Here we go. Comment conditions on the denial of said motion to inhibit. So when you see this, you would have to look at uh, and recall all the grounds for inhibition. And therefore, after having done that, you relate the grounds for inhibition with the factual setting. So we now go and have a look at the, the factual setting of the problem. Despite the antagonistic positions taken by the parties in the respective pleadings, and particularly the seriousness of the imputations made by the complaint against Judge Reyes. So the judge refused to inhibit himself by taking cognizance of civil action filed with the against spouses against the complainant, pending before his honor Sala, for the reason that the ground relied upon for said inhibition is not among those provided for by the rules of court. Comment with decisions on the denial of said motion to inhibit. Now, let's look at the way how I crafted my answer. Judges like Caesar's wife should not only be above suspicion, but also free from all appearances of, of suspicion. This maxim should have been used by Judge Reyes when the motion inhibit was brought before him. For after all, the ground mentioned in Section 1 of Rule 137 of the Rules of Court when inhibiting and disqualifying judges from hearing and trying cases, as for its last grounds, other grounds which the judge in his discretion may consider as a ground for inhibition. Thus, the rules itself recognizes, again, it should be recognized, that the enumerated grounds are not exclusive in themselves in order to give the judges some leeway in exercising their discretion. In order to avoid the appearance of impropriety, Justice Reyes should have exercised his discretion in favor of inhibition. Let's look at the problem that was uh, toast to justice, former Justice Calixto Saldivar, when he took the bar. He got 96 in civil law. He was uh, third place in 1928. I would like to remember that the subject where you have computation is not taxation. It is succession. But sometimes the computation is uh, only in general terms, not in specific terms. So remember that, huh? as sometimes I tell my students in taxation, taxation, walang kakwenta kwenta taxation. Why? Because there's no computation done in taxation. So let's have a look at the question that was answered by Justice Saldivar. The only relatives of A at the time of his death were B, a brother of the whole blood, C, a brother of the half blood, and D, a grandson of another half brother. A died in the state, who are entitled to inherit property, and in what proportion? Now, this, this is a bit difficult if you're not familiar with the, the rules on succession. Look at this answer. In this case, only B and C are entitled to inherit the properties of A. D cannot inherit because being a grandson of another brother, the right of presentation does not extend to him. The right of presentation extends only to the children or brothers, children of brothers or sisters, whether of the whole or half blood. In the above case, B being a brother of the whole blood, A is entitled to inherit twice as much as C, who is a half blooded brother. And that's the end of part six. As our convention, you know, take a break, enjoy your break, and then after the break, we shall take up part seven, which is the continuation of analytical techniques for fact centered questions. So we shall uh, discuss later on the different kinds of fact centered questions, such as, for example, role playing. We have not talked about that. So uh, again, we see each other in a little while.